Tara, spring it. Welcome to Clear Mountain. We uh, endeavored through a good hour of technical difficulties to bring you this interview, and I'm so grateful Tara was willing to endure with, with us. So, Tara, thank you for joining us. Hi, Ajahn. So, Tara uh, is a spiritual teacher who, from teenage years onward, has been deeply interested in personal growth and self-development. She holds an MA in education and has postgraduate qualifications in Gestalt therapy, body awareness therapy, and transpersonal spiritual therapy. She has worked as a drugs counselor, counselor for adolescents, and general psychotherapist since 1988. Tara has been a dedicated Buddhist practitioner since 1986. In 1997, she received encouragement from her Buddhist teacher, Rigjin Shikpo, to teach meditation. Since 2010, Tara has specialized in helping people suffering from Kundalini symptoms, also known or the Kundalini symptom, also known as spiritual crisis. She herself had her first Kundalini awakening at the age of 17. Tara has worked with over 2,000 clients suffering from spiritual crisis as a Kundalini teacher and therapist in many thousands of sessions. She is the author of 10 self-help books, which have been translated into nine languages. And as a bit of context for how I came to hear of Tara, I have recently been encountering quite a few practitioners in our community and elsewhere who, after emerging from intensive retreat, either 10 day retreats or other versions, have suffered some pretty distressing symptoms, including dissociation and uh, visions, voices, and more. Additionally, in the monastery, you often encounter uh, monks and practitioners who over the course of many years encounter increasing difficulties, uh, both mentally and physically, which just don't resolve in the meditative practices as we are often uh, taught them in those monastic environments. And when I approached a practitioner in our community, I know who's really worked with these symptoms in himself, the teacher he most strongly recommended was Tara. And so for the sake of others who may have encountered these difficulties themselves coming out of meditation, retreat, or prolonged spiritual practice, um, or know of those who have, I thought bringing Tara onto the uh, channel would be really helpful. So Tara, thank you so much for taking the time and enduring through uh, the hour of technical difficulties to be here with us. Thank you for inviting me. So the first question I wanted to ask is the term Kundalini can come across to many as a novel term. Um, I think in some circles, it might even be looked at as a little new age, although I'm not buying into that characterization. But if someone were to come to this interview and be confused by the term. It's not something they might have heard in Theravada circles, etc. Um, how would you explain it and why is it relevant? Yeah, let's uh, let me explain a little bit about uh, Buddhist history to make sure that nobody gets the impression that this is just a very modern new agey thing. Uh, Kundalini has existed for many, many century, centuries in different cultures. Um, I explain it from the Buddhist point of view. So the Buddha uh, um, worked uh, in 2000, 2,500 years ago. And then for a few hundred years, we had Theravada. And then for a few hundred years, we had Mahayana. And then around uh, the uh, sixth century, then we had the Tantrayana. And that is often referred to as the third turning of the Buddhist wheel of wisdom. And here in the Tantrayana, uh, we people work with the inner energies, with the channels, with the chakras, and most importantly, with the kundalini. And in layman's terms, kundalini is sexual energy, sexual energy that isn't voided down and out through sexual acts, but are reversed and brought into the body. And what it does in the body, it illuminates uh, uh, things that are in the shadow which is a term of modern psychology, but it's very useful here. Um, so basically things that were repressed in your unconscious mind will through this process become conscious. That can for some people be very disorientating and tumultuous phase. 
but ultimately it's a good thing to happen because if you have a lot of negativity in your unconscious mind you cannot get enlightened no matter how much you meditate it's just something that drags you down and uh, so in tantrayana they worked very much with this energy and interestingly in tantrayana mostly women were teachers and the men voluntarily um, looked up to their female teachers because they thought women are more talented in this area and um and this phase went on until 1200 and then the muslims came came and then buddhism was uh, mostly eradicated in, in in india and from this uh, tantrayana phase two branches survived and one is kundalini yoga in india and the other one is tibetan buddhism and uh, as far as i understand in in kundalini yoga they don't have much many scriptures that have survived maybe this this was oral traditions and things might have been distorted or or, or not uh, uh, i don't know that so much but in tibetan buddhism it is their speciality that they've really preserved these texts as they were written in the original meticulously from one teacher to the to the next and then they form these very very long lineages and one lineage is, for example, this Demahasida, as they're called in Tantrayana, was a lady called Suda, Sugasidi. And uh, she taught Tilupa, and he taught Narupa, which is an, a famous uh, person, a scholar in Tibetan Buddhism. And then Mapa, the translator from Tibet, came over the mountains down to India, got the texts, brought them home, translated them, taught his very famous disciple, Milarepa, and from Milarepa, we've heard, uh, and he, Milarepa is one of the most famous saints in Tibetan Buddhism. And from him, uh, we've heard that he, that he used the uh, meditation he called Kandali, which is the same thing. It's just been a little bit different wording, word. Um, and he said, this Kandali meditation is very much superior to um, other meditations that he's, that he's done. And he claimed that through that method that he uses desire um, as the agent, uh, we can actually reach enlightenment in one single lifetime, which in other branches of Buddhism is not seen like that, that where they say you have to practice and practice for, for aeons and many, many lifetimes. And uh, so we also know uh, similar uh, practices in Qigong and from China. Uh, where in, in the pelvis they call it the Dantian and then through certain breathing techniques and visualizations they channel this energy up the spine and then down in the front of the body and they call that microcosmic orbit or small water wheel or uh, a small universe and uh, but it's the same idea that this the, the energy from the lower um, bottom of our body um, uh, is, is transferred to the higher uh, chakras and energy levels. And um, now if you go on Amazon and there's and you put in Kundalini and then you get some very highly rated book, Kundalini, open your third eye, develop the supernatural powers. It's probably written by a chat bot. I don't know. Maybe I'm a bit <laughs> prejudiced here. Uh, but um, as Buddhists, uh, we are obviously taught that we shouldn't have a priority uh, wish to develop these supernatural powers. Nevertheless, uh, through the work with the Kundalini energy, we, we are capable of developing these powers, uh, clairvoyance, spiritual healing. But they are, as we know, they are a byproduct. Our main goal should always be to reach enlightenment for the sake of all beings. And, uh, but that is also the great danger in, in the whole Kundalini uh, situation, because some people can use that for unscrupulous gains and uh, spiritual teachers, which we know as charlatans who abuse their disciples, of which we unfortunately have so many, uh, if, they're, if they're very successful, then they have a city called fascination power, which we also call charisma. 
which is is this energy, uh, this sexual energy that suffuses their whole being. So they become highly attractive. They can attract a lot of followers, and then he, they can abuse them to their heart's desire. And we know many, many stories where that's happened. And so that's the dark side of the Kundalini. And um, why some people might be also afraid of that. But in principle, it is it is a you know it's the strongest fuel in our in our spiritual quest. And um, and so um, you have to be careful if you have a very strong fuel. You know, if you put that into your car, car suddenly drives double as fast. Uh, but in principle, it is a good thing. Thank you for that description and tracing the threads back all the way to you know the early days of of Buddhism and contextualizing this term Kundalini for those who haven't. Um, weren't intentionally practicing these uh, different techniques, weren't intentionally bringing up Kundalini, but still, um, is it possible for the, that energy to awaken regardless? And if that happens without uh, a teacher or a guide or intention, what are the pitfalls? Or what have you seen as kind of the Kundalini syndrome, as you call it? Yes. So um, in my work as a Kundalini therapist, I work with just those people who had so-called spontaneous Kundalini awakenings. And, and they said, what have I done? Why have I been chosen? I've never been even that spiritual. Um, you know, and then they can be easily um, overwhelmed, you know, by this experience. So I personally like to call the Kundalini awakening a consciousness, consciousness expansion. This, this is what this really is. And uh, the, I only use the word Kundalini because people can find me on Google. They would otherwise not find me. Uh, but we have, what, what this is, is not a physical uh, event. Uh, it is a consciousness expansion and the consciousness expansion happens foremost in four areas. The first one is that our own unconscious mind becomes conscious. And our unconscious mind is, um, literally stored in our physical body in the left shoulder maybe i have some uh, traumas from my childhood that i can't remember don't want to remember in the right shoulder i have some horrible antisocial aggressive impulses that of course i do not want to know at all because i'm a nice buddhist and so we our entire body is a storehouse of all that stuff from this life and from our previous lives tendencies and um, and they're often in conflict with each other. It's chaos, you know. <laughs> and uh, and when when the Kundalini arises, then uh, this this conscious material becomes conscious. And then people say, "I remember childhood traumas. I get so sensitive. Everything gets to me. My family, I can't stand them any longer. Uh, my husband, I need to divorce him. I mean, I'm exaggerating. I'm just saying the." Worst case scenarios, please. Nobody getting afraid that this will all happen to them. You know, um, I'm just saying that some people, if they haven't worked on themselves before and they live their life in a rather unconscious way and have made decisions, maybe marrying a certain person and then remaining in a bad marriage, that they might uh, very well say, I can't stand this anymore. This pushing things under the rug doesn't work anymore. And that's, this can, of course, be very disconcerting. But that's the first part which where the consciousness awakening expansion happens, our own unconscious mind. The second one is that we, the same happens with other people, that we can look behind the mask. Oh, this nice person that I knew, suddenly I can see all this passive aggression, aggression in them. That's not so nice. Or, or I can see how they're manipulative or some ways and, and so on. The third aspect is um, paranormal uh, experiences, visions, clairvoyance, voices, all sorts of stuff. And for the uh, unprepared, that can be very frightening. Some people take it totally in their stride, but others say, I'm going mad. I need to go to, to psychiatry and get some pills. You know, it depends on your personality. And then the fourth consciousness expansion is, of course, the one we all want, and that is higher states of spiritual enlightenment. You feel it uh, as often in the in the presence of 
getting amazing states of bliss. And through this bliss, through this incredible joy and rapture, you can actually then recognize the nature of reality, which we, we want to do. And um, and that's the, the ultimate purpose, the ultimate consciousness expansion uh, of what we um, want to achieve. Now, some people love paranormal experiences, others get afraid of them. Higher stages of consciousness, uh, enlightenment, of course, we love that. Maybe some people also feel a bit bad about it and say they are now so different from normal society, they don't know how to fit in anymore. So all of these things can create a lot of um, disconcerting experiences. It, but it doesn't have to be that way. And particularly if you are prepared for it, if you know that this will come and you recognize that, it's a little bit uh, like puberty. If you are prepared for it, if you've been told what will happen, you're not so upset when it happens. Otherwise, you might think you have a sickness of some kind or something's gone terribly wrong. <laughs> I, uh, I know people who do think that. So um, if we were to approach or speak about the revealing of the darkness in in ourselves and to some extent intuiting what was behind the mask perhaps in others and not being able to push stuff under the rug anymore i'm curious about two scenarios one is how you would guide just someone you know maybe it's not this massive single event but rather just a lot of the things you pointed to on a mundane level are happening. They are becoming aware of some of their darker tendencies, and that is disconcerting when they expected their life to grow just brighter from the practice, and they don't feel like they're able to fit in uh, to their life as it was anymore. How do you guide people through that? And then I am curious at one point to talk about the more acute scenario where someone goes to a multi-day retreat and comes out with uh, pretty severe symptoms of dissociation and the like. But to start with the more gentle scenario, how would you advise someone to move through that? Yes, uh, so information is key. This is the same, like I said, with puberty. If you know what will happen, it doesn't frighten you that much. But with Kundalini, uh, it is... Uh, Often you feel you're the only one in your peer group. You don't know anyone else who has that. And just imagine you had puberty all by yourself. Nobody else. Everybody stayed children and you are becoming a teenager. That would can be could be quite frightening. But if somebody comes along and says, well, everybody will go through this eventually. And you're a little bit the first or you're ahead of the crowd. And, uh, and, and this and this will happen. Look out for it. And all is there for a good purpose. Just like in, in puberty, um, overall, you know, it's there for procreation and having a family. And I don't think many people would object that that's a good idea. Uh, in, in, in the Kundalini awakening, the ultimate purpose is to reach enlightenment and to have this, this higher stages of realization and, and most importantly, stabilize them. And, um, and so, you know, these types of things need to be explained. And also um, some people come to me and say, Tara, do I need to, to move to the country now? I don't want to move to the country. I'm quite happy in my uh, big city. And the answer is, of course, then you stay in the big city. This is just um, something that a lot of people will uh, eventually want to do. They want to have more quiet and solitude and so forth. And so, that's just a general point of view. And, and you, you know, if you read on the internet about the Kundalini, there is so much confusion and so many horror stories. So that's uh, also something that I would advise immediately. As long as you are uh, a little bit uh, frightened about this and don't read horror stories on the internet. You know, I have obviously to advertise my own book. Read my book. It's called Healing Kundalini Symptoms or... Um, enlightenment through the path of Kundalini. And there I, I will give you a realistic, uh, grounded uh, um, scenario of what you can expect. And it's all not so bad. Basically, the Kundalini will, will egg you on to 
become a more wholesome person who likes things like being in nature, um, in your work, wanting to help other people, um, want to eat a more healthful diet. Mm. None of that needs to be a horror trip, not at all. And you will you will be confronted with stuff from, from your unconscious mind. If you're good at that, maybe you had already some psychotherapy or you had a good grounding in witness consciousness. So you are able to observe the contents of your mind rather than being swept away by them. Uh, then all of that is a, is a, can be a walk in the park. Mm. So do not read horror stories. Don't do that. Mm. You know, if you go to some of these Kundalini groups, Facebook groups, and there's almost like a competition who suffers the most. Oh, I've been in bed for 20 years. I can't get up. I am surely have the best Kundalini awakening. That that's nonsense, you know. Mm. This is Kundalini is not a disease in any form. It doesn't need to uh, entail any psychological breakdown at all. This only very very few people experience that. But of course, that's of course that gets the most attention. Many people take that in their stride and um, and and are actually very, very happy. And even from the many clients that I've had, I have, um, even though they come to me because they they can't cope, yeah, uh, all of them, they say, well, it, it is hard work, but would I not want to do have it? No, I, I definitely, I'm glad I have this. This is... Um, access to all we ever wanted mm. it's only uh, that all we ever wanted comes <laughs> with a few caveats mm. and uh, so we have to to um, master a few challenges but it can be done it's not so difficult mm. and then your next question if somebody has like real bad symptoms you know you say dissociations and stuff like that i would try to do away with those types of word, word words you know the question is what are your emotions? Anxiety, sadness, anger. That's all we ever deal with. So you can dissociate it and be happy as Larry, right? So it doesn't need to be a problem. But if you're dissociated and you get really anxious and you think, I'm not really in this world, it's all so flimsy, and is this even real? Maybe this is all nihilistic, nothing. You know, and you have high level of anxiety with that then you need to treat the anxiety, not this type of thoughts. Comes the anxiety down, the world is nihilistic or not, it doesn't bother you at all, you know. You think, yeah, maybe this is all a dream, but it doesn't, you're not getting afraid about this. And that's what you want. So bring it down to those three emotions. And then um, in the method that I have developed, which is based on Tibetan Buddhism, I have an anti-anxiety technique, an anti-depression technique, and an anti-anger te technique. They all work very quickly, very effectively. N nobody who's ever worked with this as my client has, ha ha has continued to have high levels of negative emotions. You, you bring it down very quickly. Now, these emotions are a little bit more, you could say, forceful than just observing the mind, which... Uh, uh, you do in the mindfulness type exercises where, where people usually get the advice, you just sit there, observe your mind. That's a little bit of a tall order if you have if you are in, in the middle of a panic attack, you know. You know, or or if you are so in despair um, or, or having very, very strong uh, um, emotions. Um, you know, if you know how to work with the inner energies, you know, you can visualize a flower that opens into a a flower bud that opens into a flower and that brings down the anxiety much, much faster. Within minutes, it comes down from, let's say, an 8 out of 10 to 4 out of 10. Mm -hmm. And then you just keep doing that. Anxiety comes down and down and down. After a few days, a few weeks, it's down at a 3, 2. If you keep working at it, which a lot of people don't do, <laughs> if they had 2 or 3, they are okay. But if you want to get it to zero, you can get it to zero. You have no anxieties anymore. They're yeah. all gone. No more fears. Mm. And that's irrespective of what's happening around you or within you. Mm. Thank same you. With the other, it's, it's the same with the other 
with the sadness, despair, anger, sort of thing. And, and would some of those practices involve these sort of calming meditations or just a, a grounding and, and also in tandem with the view that this is normal, that we don't have to be too alarmed, something of that nature? Yes, if you do know that Kundalini, it is an intensifier. It, 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 it intensifies all your good feelings, the bad feelings, but also the good ones. So if you see a beautiful garden or a beautiful side of something, you can get such intense feelings of rapture, of bliss, that you've never had before. I mean, that's the good side of this whole thing. But if you then, somebody comes and blows a whistle and it's an annoying noise, and you think, ah, oh, I can't stand this, this is so bad. And for the sensitivity to... Uh, um, uh, sense sensations or the reaction, the, uh, you know, the reacting with strong feelings towards these types of things also intensifies, which and doesn't need to be, it, which doesn't need to be a problem, mm. because you just use these techniques, mm. and and then you 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 calm this whole thing down again, and then you just keep the good things. Okay, so the the sensitivity to the negative can be softened, and eventually without those techniques does the mind move is it a bit like a raw wound that gets healed naturally with time if um, someone doesn't have you know access to these particular techniques or is do we just have to adjust our lives to have less whistles blown in our ear and is, is that just like the the kind of situation or does the wound heal and I know the, um, wound, the wound is the wrong uh, metaphor here, you know, but the, the opening or the sensitivity. So uh, let's just say people don't know, you know, like myself, it all happens in the dark 1970s. Nobody knew anything about anything. And I had this Kundalini awakening and I had quite severe symptoms. And uh, and yes, over the, and I didn't know I had a Kundalini awakening. And yes, over the years I found relief. You know, I did some psychotherapy, I did some yoga, um, I worked on myself in any way I could think of. And uh, I, I then had to also a Buddhist teacher, which I know now also had Kundalini awakening, and uh, and he had really good methods, and that really helped me. And um, and that was all before I developed my own methods. And so I also find that with my clients, you know, if I'm not available to help them, then maybe they find another local therapist. And, you know, the only thing that really aggravates this, should maybe say that as a warning, is uh, energy healing. So if you go to an energy healer of any form, you know, like Reiki healers or with the hands on energy healing, that for some reason has often uh, a makes it worse and i've heard this dozens or hundreds of times among my clients that you have to be very careful with that but um you know even just going in nature or, or you know encountering a meditation like mindfulness which is very gentle very just sit uh, count your breath you know all of this can help and um, and people uh, will reach out for these uh, methods, you know, because Kundalini is not a disease. It doesn't make you sitting sulk sulking in the in the corner. If you have basically a, a good motivation, you will keep that good motivation, and you will say, okay, I've got a crisis here now. Let's do something about that. And then they will look whatever resources they have, their availability, and 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 will find that. But obviously, you know, I would say if you do the higher consciousness healing exercises, which are devised for this problem, mm -hmm. you get there faster, much faster. And, and is there, um, you know, obviously you can't give us a, a full rundown of any of those at the moment. Um, are there any like hints or general um, ways of describing what, what that entails for someone who's kind of in a situation like this or something that... Um, a safe place you could point them where you know that they could at least get some relief something like that um well the, the, all the exercises are in my book 
and uh, and there are easy exercises. I'll just give an example of one. Yeah, the anti-anxiety uh, exercise. So um, the way I work with that is that I get to people to rate their anxiety on a scale from zero to ten. Let's say they are at six, and then I uh, do a little meditation with them. The first one is that they need to get in contact with what they consider their higher consciousness or their deity. Could be Jesus or or Buddha or, or who, whoever, you know, and if they are, don't have anybody, it can be the Divine Mother, and, and get into this comforting connection with them. You know, people often don't utilize that enough, you know, because praying is a little bit out of fashion with, with, with a lot of people. And, uh, and they're, then they have like a higher consciousness, like the source or the universe. And but the, the universe isn't very comforting. You need a person, a humanoid person. And, um, and uh, so you start doing that. Then you visualize a um, ball of light around you with uh, strong boundaries, which represents your energy field. And uh, for people who have taken... Um, drugs or who have traumas of some there's often holes in there so if you have the holes holes in there you you know bad energies can, can come in and you feel that and they frighten you and you can repair that through your visualization so you visualize those repairing those holes and then third step is self-love i love myself with all my problems and weakness weaknesses total self-acceptance stopping the self-hatred stopping saying to yourself Oh, I should be over this. I've done already so much therapy. Why am I having this problem? No, total self-acceptance. And it can be taught and it can be learned. Mm. And then that's the, the three ground steps. And then the fourth step is to pinpoint the anxiety in your body. And you might feel it in, let's say, in your chest. You imagine in your chest a flower bud. And with the out breath, out breath the flower bud opens. Mm. Releasing, relaxing, the tense, anxious, anxiety, energy that is there. It's an energy. It's it's a contraction. And you can relax and release that if you guide it. It's not that difficult. So then beautiful light radiates out, out of this flower, out to the end of the universe, diluting, letting go. It's an, an image of letting go. And, um, and then you... Breathe slower and slower and slower. As you breathe slower, you 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 remove energy from the from the anxiety. People who are anxious, they breathe like this. If they stop, if you guide them to stop breathing like this, you know, slow down the breath. The anxiety has nowhere to manifest, and uh, you know, all of this can be taught within five minutes. A um, bit slower, like I've just done it right now but not much slower. And after these five minutes, anxiety is down 50%. You know, If you then carry on practicing in this way, it comes down to a 75%, 80%, 90%, gone. Then it comes back. Oh, it hasn't worked. No, it, it has worked. This is how the mind works. It always comes back. So you do it again. And gradually you master this, you know, you can completely and utterly remove those negative emotions from your mind. If you don't have these emotions, nothing bothers you. Thank you, Tara. That was very helpful. And the image of the unfurling flower is just beautiful. I can really intuit how that would soften this kind of tension. And one thing I hadn't expected you to speak about was the holes in the oral field caused by drug use or other things. And to be honest, I've been very interested um, in this. As you know, in, in Buddhism, we have the fifth precept against intoxicants. And one thing that's been interesting to bump up against has been the recent focus on plant medicine um, or psychedelic usage, uh, using psychedelics in the service of the spiritual path. Um, I know some of the research around it, and yet, um, it also seems to, in many ways, be in real tension with this fifth precept. And I'm curious if, you know, is there any wisdom in the kind of areas you're aware of around, do these, uh, can these 
compounds uh, rip holes in that oral field in the same way? And, and should people really approach that realm with caution because of that? Okay. I, uh, many years ago, uh, I started my career as a counselor, as a drugs counselor. So I saw all these car crashes just from using Mariana. And now as a, as a Kundalini therapist, same thing. I have many, many clients who have taken psychedelics and had a simultaneous Kundalini uh, awakening. They uh, really are the ones that suffer the worst. It's really bad. So unfortunately, I have a very dim view on all of this. <laughs> no, no, I think and you're I, right up our alley on that one, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I know they say ayahuasca can't can't do, do uh, any any harm. This is just not what I experience. You know, I've got lots of not lots uh, some clients who come to me after these ayahuasca uh, ceremonies in in a terrible state with extreme anxiety and uh, and and so showing all the signs of drug psychosis or let's say drug crisis. Mm and need a lot of reassurance until that comes down, you know. So the, the image I use is, you know, we have some landmines in our brain and you don't know how many landmines you have, but it might be just one drug use, one joint, and mm. this landmine goes up and makes, you know, a, a lot of damage that will haunt you for years and decades. Mm. And, um, and so for that reason, I, I say, don't do it, you know. People think it's a shortcut. Uh, I think it's a very, very dangerous path to tread on. It might, it's a path that has, okay, the landmine analogy is quite good. And do you feel that all the drugs that are, are there any ones you've seen as especially da dangerous or damaging? And if someone does trip on one of those landmines, what do you see to repair it? Is it just a steady, a steady healing once you've stepped on the explosive? Um, well, again, it depends very much on your own resilience, your own resources that you have to get over something like that. I would, I would hope that if I had an experience like that, I would get over it more quickly. <laughs> but after a lifetime of working with these types of things, uh, but um you know it depends how people how much you know ability they have of witnessing their emotions rather than identifying with that and uh you know it's you know it's a, like a very bad dream you can dream after that it's a nightmare and um well if you ask me which drugs are particularly uh, dangerous well all the psychedelics all of them and um the whole potbury the alcohol just destroys your body, you know, it leaves your mind more intact, but uh, <laughs> you know, it destroys your liver and your brain and everything else. And a cigarette as well, they, they give you lung cancer and so on. So um, now it's the psychedelics that are the problems. And But I don't want people to be put in prison for having having that, you know, I don't think that that's a good thing. But if you legalize them, but you don't really give people proper warnings, that yeah. I don't think that's a good move either. Thank you. This is, uh, yeah, it's, it's refreshing to hear that perspective. And I do know people who have definitely tripped on very large landmines. Um, another <clears throat> landmine that seems to, well, the analogy might be wrong, but another issue I've seen manifest with people's spiritual path is, um, and, and I think it might be associated with Kundalini awakening um, and this expansion of consciousness is a, first of all, some monastics who, as they enter robes or stay at monasteries for long periods, certainly some of the things in the shadow come to light like childhood trauma, but then also sometimes there's these very persistent health problems which won't go away and which seem almost inexplicable. They can't map them onto anything in particular, but it's, it's often enough that it'll drive people to, to disrobe or take pretty drastic action. Um, what's that? And what would you advise? I mean, is that associated with this awakening? Um, no. Kundalini in no way or form is a form of disease. Hmm. And as a whole, my clients are a quite healthy bunch. And um, 
and I, and I think it is because this awakening process drives you to improve your life in every way, and that includes also your diet and all the health treatments that you do, like wanting to practice qigong or mm. yoga and so on. And um, now the way I understand celibacy is if you if you look at it in uh, sort in the context of Kundalini is the idea is if you put a stop to all sexual activities, then the the sexual energy only has one way to go and that is up, yeah, mm. and, and basically for, forcing a Kundalini awakening. Mm. Uh, the um, the the reality is, but is often that that's the theory. In practice, that it does doesn't often work like that. And what really works is a, a repression of sexual energy. It's basically numb yourself down from the waist downward. You know, it's just like okay, that's the stuff we're not dealing with. No more power, no more sex, and 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 no more greed for money and all of that. Yeah, poverty and celibacy and and uh, obedience three main vows isn't it and um so that that's and that pertains to the three lower chakras mm. so then people really try to work basically with the upper chakras have a lot of awareness um a lot of, a lot of loving kindness uh non-violent speaking and so on and the trouble with that is that the lower chakras are also responsible for everything physical in our life and that includes our health mm. and if you do away with the lower part of your body and say i'm not interested in all that stuff anymore then uh, it can lead to a, a, a under energizing of this part mm. but if you under if you over energize in your in, in your lower body and you're a monk and you go around and always feel extremely uh, sexually aroused that's a problem right mm. what do you do with that and uh, uh, and so over time, this kind of many, you know, celibates uh, just learn to not go there mentally anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then the whole thing becomes numb and under energized, and that brings health problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do I know this? Because when you when you look who's working with energy medicine, the the most the most skillful that's the Chinese with the whole um, qigong movement. And what do they do basically? They they help you through the qigong exercises to um, uh, to energize the lower chakras. I mean, they call that dantian. They don't use the word chakras, so that's just cultural. And so you 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 energize the lower chakras, and um, by by basically focusing a lot on on, on uh, meditating on your navel. Or the center below the navel, and and doing pelvic floor exercises where you squeeze and let go and feel the energy uh, flowing from there. And if you do that, then your health get be gets better. Thank you. I, I found qigong to be one of the most uh, powerful articulations of the energy movement um, I've, I've ever encountered, and I can definitely uh, understand and appreciate the issue of uh, a monastic or a celibate turning away from those energies completely and not knowing how how to channel them correctly and that just leading to a, a stagnation of sorts one thing i've seen with some practitioners is you spoke about the third expansion of consciousness being a sensitivity to the paranormal and i'm curious if you see this it's quite accepted in thailand but i've seen very few westerners undergo that particular sensitivity at least in a way that they are willing to speak about so i'm curious first of all is this something you do see often in in people and um what do they do with it and uh just as a little sidebar i've noticed sometimes the people who seem sensitive to that realm maybe not I don't know if it's completely associated, but there tends to be sometimes a, a proclivity to conspiracy theory. And I'm not saying that the supernatural are delusional because we um, believe in such things. I'm just saying, I'm curious if how you see that awakening playing out in people and are there pitfalls uh, such as that? Okay. 
I, I, I first talked about just the paranormal. Do many of my clients have that? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, but there are also quite a number who have, uh, uh, I have a Kundalini awakening test. Everybody can have that for free on my website. You just have to put your name in there and they get the test. Yeah. There are five criteria uh, uh, for um, a Kundalini awakening. And the fifth one is paranormal experiences. And not everybody has that when they come to me. But uh, everybody will get that along the line. You know, people get more clairvoyant and uh, get uh, more, you know, they can do things with their minds, which they shouldn't be able to do and, uh, and, and so forth. And um, so, um, but some people also get frightened of this where it happens involuntarily and then then you need to have ways of shutting this down and this again it can be done you can tell your mind thank you but no thank you i don't want to see any ghosts hmm. and you just tell to you can talk to your mind like you would talk to a, a child you know no we're not interested in talk in ghosts we're not doing that hmm. and then the mind uh, is like a little child just doesn't listen the first time you tell tell it something so another ghost experience then you just say it again like like a mother kindly but strictly no no ghosts we're not doing that and if you do that for a little while you know weeks months just like educating a child your mind will your your um, unconscious mind will listen and then these experiences will get less and then stop but you should be very careful when you shut your third eye you know because once you shut it it's not so easy to open it again and afterwards you think oh I used to have all these insights and I, I knew all this and that and now I feel I, I see nothing so you know you need to be careful and and basically um, the paranormal uh, experiences you can also choose them you know you can you make can make a list mm. I want to know I want to do spiritual healing I think that one is a good one to have you know mm. if, if a family member is ill you just put your hands on them don't need to call the doctor so quickly mm. And, and you can heal yourself and that's a, a good one to have i i personally also absolutely want to always know everything mm. you know i want to have answers to my questions and so this is the 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 supernatural power that in me has developed the strongest and uh that i have conversation with my tara and she answers me mm. and, uh, and 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 a lot of clients you know go that way you know they um i had a i had a kundalini support group at the, uh, last week and somebody asked that question like you who can talk to god does does that happen often and i said okay let's make a little survey and i just asked the people present which were 15 people so who of you can speak to god and uh, five people lifted their hand you know so it's you, you know a lot of them can do that you know it is uh, actually something that is dormant in us and uh, and you know when you when you um, don't have a kundalini awakening you think that's complete blasphemy or uh, you know futile to even think that you could do this but you know we can do a lot more things but we were never told that we can do this you know I, I remember 30 years ago I was in London in England and they, they have a college for psychic studies and so um, I went there and basically what I discovered there is that I had a fully functioning clairvoyance already. I just never used it. And when I had clairvoyant experiences, I, uh, I would doubt them and I would, um, I would uh, think, oh, that's weird. What is this? But after I've been there and had the confirmation through those exercises that set up, I, I knew I, I could do this very easily. You know, I, I, I always could do this. I don't know if I always could do it, but I definitely at that point, I already could do it. And uh, so, so yes, these, these experiences will come and they will come in the area of your greatest passion. So if you, let's say you want to be a healer, you probably, do, you know, de de develop first the healing abilities. If you want to know everything like me, you might get clairvoyant and so forth. Yeah. So, and you can guide that through your own wishes and where you put your energy. That's where you will get these cities. Okay, now that was the first part of the question. Good. Now the second one, what about conspiracy theories? So it's, um, 
the problem with uh, conspiracy theories is that uh, they make you feel bad. You know, they you know if you really believe in them, you feel disempowered, very angry, very upset, possibly dis depressed and despairing because you just feel like a little worm, and there's this terrible force that wants you to bring you down in some way. And so I de definitely say, um, be careful not to go in that direction because there's nothing good in there. You know, you might get an initial high where you think, oh, ah, now I know how this all works and I figured it all out and chemtrails and yeah, they're coming again and throwing chem uh, chemicals uh, onto me. But how do I feel if I year after year believe things like that? Very, very bad indeed. And so um, if you don't have proof, absolute proof that what you believe is true and it makes you feel bad, maybe you just don't want to go there. Thank you. Thank you, Tara, for all this wisdom. And I, I won't believe in chemtrails for the next few years, at least, uh, hopefully <laughs> spurred on by you. Um, but I, I just really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we have a very somewhat isolated or uh, insular landscape of our how we conceive of spiritual practice in some of the meditative circles I move through mainly and to bring in this other perspective uh, which speaks to and touches on so many relevant experiences people have is is very helpful so I, I really appreciate you taking the time to to join and speak with us you're welcome <laughs> and um I'll put uh Tara's uh website into the show notes for those who are interested in finding or connecting with her um, and uh, take care i know you're in near south africa i believe at the moment N near morocco which is north, north africa. north africa sorry okay well i hope the uh so is it summer there or winter in that case are we uh it, it is winter but it is winter okay. but it is warm okay good <laughs> well have a wonderful time there. And um, we hope to, uh, if you ever near Seattle, please come say hello. I will. Okay. Thanks, Ashan.